Good morning and uh, welcome to Amazing Excellency Academy. In today's conversation, we are looking at uh, unit number six of agricultural economics, the support services to agricultural sector, the support services to agriculture. That is the unit that we are looking at, unit number six. Welcome to the session and we continue. The government intervenes when the market fell to give an allocation of the resources that are deemed appropriate by the society, okay? So you see that the government can intervene by either doing nothing or doing everything. So when the government is doing everything, this time around, the government is playing the role as a spectator when the government is doing nothing, is playing the role as a spectator in the market. But when the government does everything, it can take an active role either as a producer or buyer. This is what the government can, it can either become a buyer or the producer, or it can just do nothing and be a spectator in the market. So the government could instead deal with the imperfection in market, and this is what is known as uh, support services, right? Support services. The whole idea behind these support services is not to impose the market fundamentals because of failed markets, but instead it is to support markets so as to remove the impact of imperfections. So you'll understand that in chapter number six, when you're looking at supported services, we cover the various market imperfections and look at the possible measures to support the farmers uh, farming uh, or facing these imperfections. The first problem that we have is the problem of storage, right? Storage. So in economics theory, we study production and supply jointly but recognizing the difference between the two. Production refers as to, uh, the factors influencing what and how much is produced, while supply looks at the availability of the commodity on the market. So supply looks at the availability, but the production looks at the factors influencing what and how much is produced. So the decision to produce should be actually delinked from the decision to supply. If we want to delink the two, we need to understand the need or we deal with storage, okay? Which is actually an intermediate stage. So you find that the goods must be produced when it is optimal to produce and supplied not when produced, but when it is optimal to supply. So you see there is a challenge here. The goods are produced when it is optimal to be produced. But because of the problem of storage, storage here, we have uh, supply being implemented even when it is not optimal. So we need all, both of the two, supply and the production to happen at optimal points. Now, in the absence of storage, what we find is that supply always comes automatically after production. This is partly responsible for seasonal swings in agricultural product prices. Okay? So since production is season, for most crops, that is to say, it's true for rain-fed agriculture and most weather affected crops. Supply also follows the same fluctuation, posing fluctuations in the prices also, right? So we're saying that since the production is seasonal for most crops, then the supply also follows the same fluctuation, posing fluctuation in the, what, in the prices. So most agricultural output is available on the market in one period or absent in another. 
So even with a plunge in the prices, farmers are obliged to sell their output due to lack of storage facilities. So farmers are just, you know, obliged just to sell. This is because they do not have uh, storage. So in, if storage facilities were available, the farmers would be able to smoothen the supply of output. Okay. Any question? <clears throat> All right, we are set with the storage. Let's look at the second uh, pressure, which is the access to market. Access to market, the second, the access to market, number one. We find that for especially the small scale of farmers, agricultural producers are often denied access to market for the agricultural produce due to AV either the long distance to market or impassable roads during times of buying inputs or selling outputs. They also lack access to input markets and have to trade in these markets through intermediaries, right? So you see, we can have long distances or we have impassable roads and these two will affect the farmers access to the market, okay? So they, they, they will lack access to input markets and they have to trade even via uh, intermediates. So a good transportation system would actually improve this problem. A good transportation system would actually improve uh, this problem. The second challenge that we look at is the issue of the marketing policies. Marketing policies. In this respect, you're talking about maize. maize. <clears throat> so the maize market in the country, to be respective, uh, to, 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 be, to be specific, we're talking about Zambia now. In the context of Zambia, the maize market in the country is heavy, dominated by the food reserve agents, an agency under the Ministry of Agriculture. So the mandate of the agency includes providing a guaranteed market for selected crops, particularly maize, okay? So the agency is able to buy maize right at the community level. At the beginning of the marketing season, the minister, responsible for agriculture announces the recommended price for the commodity. Now, this is the price at which the Food Reserve Agency will buy the commodity. This is the minister trying to announce at the beginning of the marketing season. He's announcing the price of the given commodity, right? So in setting the recommended price, the ministry has to take into account the concerns that come from both the demand and the supply sides. So if the commodity is priced high, you know that consumers will suffer because of food will it be relatively expensive. Okay. And again, when the when the price is too low, it will force investment out of the main subsector or out of the agriculture sector as a whole. So the long-term effect is lower production and the higher prices. So when the prices become low, there is no motivation, okay, to our investors. They are not motivated to invest in the sector. So they move the investors out of the sector. And because of that, we will have low supply of lower levels of production in the sector. The recommended price, however, is not binding on other buyers in the market. So we find that the Food Reserve Agency, FRA, price provides a signal from which other players in the market can base their decisions. So it's more like um, the Food Reserve Agency price is a benchmark. When the, the, the other players in the market look at the price, uh, that has been set by the food reserve agents, then they will base all their decisions, either to increase by just a small margin 
or reduce by some margin. But most likely, other players will increase by some margin. So the food reserve agency price is basically the standard or is set as a basis upon which other players in the market will have to base their own decisions. When you look at the fourth problem that we have here is the issue of credit. Let's have the issue of credit here to the farmers. How does the government handle it? Okay, the financial markets link those with a surplus of funds to those that do not have the funds. There are various forms of credit that we have, but most common, especially for farmers, is a loan. Okay, a loan is common for farmers especially. However, you know, to access the loan, there are requirements that a farmer needs to meet, such as having a collateral. You can just access a loan. You need a collateral. So a farmer will have to meet, uh, will have to have a collateral for them to access the loans. Let's have the other sources of credit, the common ones. The first one is the credit may also be provided through the provision of inputs on credit. We can decide to uh, give the inputs to our farmers on credit, okay? So farmers can be given the inputs on, on credit. Uh, or farmers often enter into the contractual farming where a potential buyer also provides the inputs. This is prominently in the cash crop subsector. What you find is that a farmer will often enter into a contractual farming. How does he do it? Okay. The buyer himself provides the inputs. It's very much prominent. It is prominent indeed in the cash crop subsector. The second other sources, other source of credit is the informal credit. The informal credit. These are often not formally registered to operate as creditors, but nonetheless take advantage of the absence of adequate credit providers. So they look at this, they're like, okay, uh, we don't have the adequate credit providers. Then those informal guys, the, the, the guys who are not formally registered, they take advantage of that. Uh, they operate as creditors and they give out loans in the sector, okay? Now, the challenges are usually there to farmers, especially when it comes to accessing these uh, credits, number one. In particular, the markets do not operate optimally in providing farmers to the special needs of the agriculture. So the first thing that we find is that, number one, the input on credit, which is available through contractor farming, binds the farmers to a limited number of output buyers. I'm saying that the input, right? The input that is actually there on credit, okay? The input on credit, which is available through contractual farming binding, it is there on contractual farming binds. It binds the farmer to a limited number of output buyers, okay? So the farmer is, is bound to a limited number of output buyers because of the input on credit, which is just available through contractual farming. The form of credit has a bearing on what is produced and the quantities thereof. The second challenge we find is that the provision of loans from banks has conditions that most rural households can seldom meet. The rural households, these guys really find it a challenge to meet uh, the requirements or the conditions that they need for them to access uh, to be given these loans. For example, most of the farmers do not have assets that can be used as collaterals. So most rural households and, uh, and therefore the small scale of farming households hold land under the customer lease system, leading to less optimal uh, production, right? They hold land under, you know, the 
the traditional system or I would say the customary system, right? So there is less, it leads to less than optimal production. Usually they do not become super uh, productive. The other issue that we look at usually, this one is the fifth issue. It is the issue of information, information, right? The issue of information, okay? With information, what do we do? One of the characteristics of an efficient market is information. Rather being well informed about the happenings in the market, such as information about the various variable in the market, information about new technologies, information about new opportunities and threats to farming, such as maybe the outbreak of diseases. Okay, so we have got the limitations to information here yeah, when it comes to this sector. Okay, so most farmers are rural folks. Number one, the level of education is usually below average. Number two, the access to media is also limited due to poor communication infrastructure, poor road networks. Number three, utility services such as electricity are also lacking, which hinders their adoption on technology. So these guys do not have utility services. They don't have electricity. Okay, so they are lacking indeed. This hinders their adoption on the technology. Number four, the cost of devices such as smartphones that can improve their access to information is also a challenge. So you find that the, 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 the cost of the devices there, such as you know, smartphones like iPhones and other advanced gadgets. So you find that uh, these guys lack really access to information. In order to bridge the gap, many governments provide information specific to agriculture along with other extension services. So the government is trying to cape the challenge. They provide uh, to our farmers information specific to agriculture along with other extension services. So it brings uh, some extension services, okay? Let's look at the National Agriculture Information Service, the National Agriculture Information Service, NICE. To promote the adoption of the proven agricultural technologies by small scale of farmers, through the use of the mass media in order to enhance the adoption of improved farming methods as a way of increasing their production activity. So uh, National Agriculture Information Service is there to promote the adoption of the proven agricultural technologies by small scale of farmers through the use of the mass media in order to enhance the adoption of improved farming methods as a way of increasing their production and productivity. Okay, so the institution actually gathers and it disseminates information, especially that is targeted to the farming communities. The information would include the following. It can be based on potential markets, the information on the spread of diseases affecting farming, or pests that might affect their crops. We can have the information on the new technologies from Agricultural Research Institute. We can have the information of success stories from other farmers in, or, uh, from other farmers. Okay, we, it is usually disseminated to enhance technological advancement. Okay, so. <clears throat> The other issue, which is the sixth issue that we look at as the government is trying to offer supportive services, it is the extension services. The extension services, number six. This is actually refers to the extending or usually government services closer to the target population. So it refers to extending usually government services closer to the, gov, uh, to the target population. 
So here we find that the trained and equipped extension officers, best performing farmers, are assigned to work with the community to help the farming community improve on their farming practice. Trained and well equipped extension officers or best farming farmers and to work with the community to improve on the farming practices. Okay, this is also, this is actually said to enhance the uptake of technology and technology from agriculture research as well as technology generated by doing through best farming farmers. I'm saying that this is said to enhance the uptake of knowledge and technology from agriculture research institutions, institutions as well as knowledge generated by doing from best performing farmers. The extension services can also involve training farmers on how to respond to calamities such as outbreak of livestock diseases. We can train the farmers on how to respond uh, to calamities such as outbreak of livestock diseases. The farmers are oriented on the best way to respond to the potential calamity, both preventive and remedial. Number three. The farming, uh, the support services or the extension services. Number three, the extension services also helps improve. They helps to improve the interaction between the farming community and the government. So usually there is now a link through the, sub, uh, the extension services between the government and the farming community. So that interaction is basically enhanced or improved. It's a way of promoting government programs and policies as well as obtain feedback from the communities. Let's look at uh, accelerating agricultural research in lower developed countries. So the replication of technology is a difficulty in the agriculture sector given its nature. Owing to large areas involved, it is difficult to alter or change whether to suit a given production process or not. So actually the differences in weather or climate patterns affect the replication of technology. For instance, let's have the improved seed varieties. The animal breeds will do well in one region and fail in, in the other region. It is for this reason that every nation must strive to create own technology which is suited uh, to the prevailing weather conditions. Shall we look at technology now as a public good? Once we generate the technology, we will understand that it lacks excludability. The provider cannot keep it away from other or he or she wishes to deprive the non payers right? <laughs> You can't say, okay, now, because I've brought it, no one should do this, right? No one should do because this uh, as they pay. So research in the sector requires a lot of money. non library it is not socially optimal to keep the good away from the non pairs Let's look at the cooperative institutions and the agriculture development. So the cooperative, have become common and most farmers use it to access a, a government support programs. So the cooperatives are mainly farmers associations or organization meant to bring farmers together. So the idea behind the corporations is to bring the farmers together, right? Uh, the, the cooperatives have benefits, right? So the following are some of the benefits of cooperatives. Number one, there is an increased access to market. Okay, we see that by pooling resources of many farmers, cooperatives are able to increase their influence on the markets. When they pool resources of many farmers, they will be able to increase their influence on the market. Again, the farmers can engage in bulk buying of inputs for members, which reduces the average cost of the farmer. So bulk buying can occur some discounts and reduce transportation costs for individual farmers. 
The other benefit of cooperatives is that the beginning power of farmers is enhanced because they speak with one voice, okay? So the beginning power of farmers is enhanced because the farmers are now speaking with one voice. So the cooperatives enhance corrosion among farmers, reducing competition when selling output. This gives the farmers power to set or at least influence market prices for their produce. This increases incomes for the farmers. The third benefit is that the cooperatives are a platform through which government can easily spread its programs to farmers. So the cooperatives are a platform through which the government can easily uh, spread its programs to farmers. And the fourth one is that the cooperatives also enhance social cohesion among farmers. That is to say, social cohesion and cooperation among farmers can be of great help in fostering information sharing and technology diffusion. The fifth benefit is that the cooperatives can provide a mechanism for provision of public goods, right? They provide a mechanism for provision of public goods. We can see now that the cooperatives can nonetheless pool resources by way of contributions or towards the provision of goods of common benefit. It may also help eliminate externalities in agriculture. For, for example, through cooperatives activities of one farmer having adverse effects on other farmers can be controlled via the cooperatives. Okay, and control that via the cooperatives. And the cooperatives leaders can easily bring farmers together to discuss and resolve issues of common benefit or cost. They can discuss and resolve the issues of common benefit or cost. Shall we now look at the changes in rights to the use of land? What are some of the changes in rights to the use of land? Rights to the use of land focuses on the land holding system and the entitlement granted under each system. So in Zambia, two systems are prominent. Actually, this is the state and the traditional land holding system, right? Under the state system, land is registered and a certificate of title is normally given. So under this land holding system, the holder enjoys long tenure and the transferability of the land. Now, uh, because the long tenure of land, because, you know, of the long tenure to land, the holder is more likely to engage in activities that will, that will prolong the good life of the land. Remember, the land can lose value. Sometimes then you have to uh, add value. You have to seek to prolong the life of the land, especially if you know this is yours. Okay. In addition, the certificate of tight and transferability of land enable farmers to access the market credit and uh, the loans. Under the traditional system, land is held as part of inheritance from past generations. It is not registered, often it cannot even be transferred with easy. So the land is not registered or documented, right? This does not enable farmers to use the land as collateral in the acquisition of credit, because basically if the land is not registered, it is not documented, then they cannot actually use it as a collateral, right? They can't use it as a, as a collateral in the acquisition of credit. So many farmers do not see the traditional land holding system as secure enough for them to have a long-term focus on the land. So the system is seen as allowing farmers to hold land at the pleasure of traditional and cultural authorities. This has contributed the short-term focus in the use of land often, resulting in uh, environmentally uh, unsustainable uh, farming practices, right? There are few reforms that have been made, the land reform. So land reform actually broadly defined, it encompasses the changes of rights to land and well as the distribution of land. So in a narrow sense, we can look at land reform as involving transition 
from traditional land reporting system to state uh, audit system. So land reform will enhance the long-term productivity of land, contribute to higher income potential. So men involve a shift from, and it may involve actually a shift from individual farming, family farming to a collective farm organization that is believed to enhance agricultural productivity. Free riders may exist. Right, and a question? Okay, thank you very much for being a very good class. So we're just simply looking at uh, the support services. Some of them would be, you know, storage, access to, to the market. <clears throat> okay, lack of storage, lack of access to, uh, to the market, the market policies, uh, the credit information, extension services, and the cooperatives, okay, those are some of the issues that we look at, even as the government is trying to enhance the support services to the agriculture sector. 